is actually a talk. I'm surprised I haven't given this talk many times in the past because we've been doing assessments of ICS for the last 15 years, and I, I can't remember the last time I talked about how to use tools to do this type of work. So really the main purpose of this is going to be to tell you what tools we recommend you use and a methodology on how to use them on your ICS and some of the ICS specific features of these tools. Um, as I mentioned, we've been doing this for about 15 years. Uh, we've done almost every type of system you can imagine, every sector. Uh, this year we actually did an assessment of a chocolate factory, which isn't critical infrastructure, but it was a lot of fun. And we've done offshore oil platforms and just about everything. And we use scanning tools and exploit tools on live industrial control systems, on live ICS. And we've been doing this for 15 years, and I can tell you we have never caused an unacceptable, and that's a key word, an unacceptable impact to operations. So I'm going to encourage you that you can do this too, that you can actually use these tools, find the information you need, without causing the plant or the pipeline or the electric grid to go down. Now, if you do it the wrong way, I can tell you many times if we had just ran these tools on the net the wrong way, we would have caused a lot of very bad problems. Um, really quickly, there's, there's two basic types of assessments. The one I'm going to talk about here today is, is one that is typical for an owner-operator. And here we're not trying to find new vulnerabilities, unknown bugs, or zero days. What we're trying to do is we're trying to find whether the system has been deployed to meet good security practice, and if all the known vulnerabilities have been addressed. And we recommend in most cases that you leave finding zero days and, and other problems to the vendors they should be the ones testing their software before it's released. Now you can do it if you want, but people are having enough time just with the first type, just deploying a system with good security practice, so that would be our recommendation. The other thing before we get into the tools that's important to understand is the online testing is the part of an assessment that everyone gets excited about. Oh, we're going to hack into the system. We're going to connect our computer to the network and run a bunch of hacking tools. And that's really important. Well, it is an important part of an assessment. There's a lot of other things. You need to review the architecture. A lot of the things we talked about earlier today about security perimeters. Um, you need to look at your configuration. Uh, you need to look at where these things are deployed. If you have access to your critical infrastructure ICS that anyone can walk into the building and plug into, you have a problem. So you want to look at that. You want to look at your policies and procedures. And, and really important, I would say, surprisingly, some of the most useful information is from interview. When you ask people what they're doing or what's important, or, or maybe you ask them what would what would happen if this went down? Or what would happen, what is the most critical part of your plant? And then, of course, the last thing and what we're going to focus on is the scanning and the testing and the exploits. When you're doing an assessment, you're going to run into, and this is true in Japan, this is true in the United States, Australia, the UK, anywhere you go. If you do assessments of control systems, you're going to find many of them are just beginning to think about security. So you're going to find all sorts of problems. You're going to find everyone using the same account with a password of password or one, two, three, four. You're going to find systems that haven't been patched for seven years and systems that nobody knows about on the network, and back doors into the network, and all sorts of problems. 
And, and really, most of them, if you look at most systems today, they may have a firewall separating the corporate network from the ICS, but usually the firewall rule set allows so much through that it's doing very little. And they might be running antivirus. That's kind of what we see as a typical starting on ICS security. So you have this problem that people are very new to this field. The other problem we have is that the protocols that we talk about, your Modbus, DNP3, Profinet, CC Link, um, just about any type of protocol, except for these wireless protocols that we talked about this morning, but most ICS protocols have no security. So if you can get onto the ICS, you can do whatever you want as an attacker. So we have real problems when we do this assessment. It's the, we're going to find a lot of problems in the network, and we're dealing with systems that are really difficult, if not impossible, to secure. So what we recommend, and, and quite frankly what we, what we do, is we focus on what we call efficient risk reduction. So what you want to think about is you walk into this ICS and you say, I have a certain amount of money or a certain amount of time. So let's say I have, I have one week to work on this and uh, $10,000. What am I going to do? What is the, where can I get the most risk reduction for the next money I spend or the next time I spend on this problem? and you want to prioritize your recommendations in the assessment based on that. Otherwise, you're going to get this assessment report that's huge. You're going to look at it, and you're going to say, what do I do? So I'd recommend that when you do an assessment report, you actually provide a prioritized list based on this efficient risk reduction that says, do this first, then this, then this. And the other thing that uh, you're going to find is that even if you had a list of 20 items and you wanted to do all those 20 items, the organization might be able to only handle four of them. Because you can only do so much at one time. An organization can only accept so much change. So by giving them this prioritized list, they can maybe knock off the first three or four. And because those were such high priority, they'll see huge improvements in security, which will motivate them to do the next four the next year. Uh, this is pretty basic, um, the elements of the risk equation. Um, I would say that it's really difficult to quantify threat. Um, if you pretend like you have a really good feeling on the threat, you're probably fooling yourself. Vulnerabilities are, are pretty easy to determine. But one of the things that's really important is this impact. So imagine you have your ICS and you're not doing any patching on your ICS. Well, it might be much less important that you patch some panel view out in the middle of nowhere directly connected to a PLC than it is to patch your SCADA server. Because if your SCADA server goes down, you lose all visibility and control. If that panel goes down, when you're sitting out in the field, you, you can't view the data. So impact is really important in determining this efficient risk reduction. And one of the easiest ways to lose credibility as someone doing an assessment is if you say something with low impact is very important. So you really need to focus on this. And this is a tough thing for security people because we're not electrical engineers. We're not chemical engineers. So you really have, this is where your interview and talking to people and understanding what's important is, is essential. OK. So here's a question for you, or a statement, not a question. Even the most basic, simple, non-intrusive scan of a PLC or ICS application can cause a denial of service condition. True or false? Definitely true. 
Definitely true. All the, all the scary things you hear about, you can't scan an ICS because it might go down. It's true, it might go down. And I'll give you two quick examples. Uh, a few years ago, we scanned a safety PLC. So this was a PLC in a pipeline, um, could, pipeline safety system that was supposed to, no matter what, this PLC was supposed to work so that basically you didn't have uh, an explosion in the pipeline. When certain conditions were met, it caused certain things to stop to have it fail safe. Well, what happened was when we were scanning the system, we hit a port that was used to upload new firmware. And the PLC said, oh, I'm getting new firmware, and the next couple of bytes started that process, and the thing crashed. And so normally when something crashes, you can reboot it and it'll come back. This thing no longer had any working firmware. So it had to be sent back and rebuilt. So this would have been a very dangerous thing and, and shows you that you need the ability to recover. And this one actually happened uh, this calendar year. We were scanning a SCADA network and they had a real-time server this was something that talked to the PLCs for monitoring and control, and then also talked to the operator stations to provide them the display. So it was really the heart of the control system. If this system goes down, the control system stops working. And we scanned the standby server because it was in a redundant pair, and that went fine. And then we scanned the real-time server and it crashed because there was one service that was running that is only running on the real-time server. It wasn't running on the standby server. But it was important to know that that service was vulnerable. There was value to that crash because then we could say, create an IDS signature so that people cannot hit that port. So you wouldn't have that fault and submit this um, this vulnerability report to the vendor so you can get a patch. So we want to scan this thing, but there's risk to it. Okay, so another statement. So if we know that we scan things, they could crash, then you would say, well, then you cannot and should not use security scanning tools on an operational ICS because they can cause important things to crash. And that's false. It's really important that you do this testing. You just have to do it the right way. So there's, the right way of scanning a control system isn't really that difficult to understand. Now, if there is a staging area or a lab, you can do your testing there first, although there is some risk as to how realistic that lab is. But if you feel it's highly realistic, you can do that. If you don't have something like that, the next thing you want to do is you want to leverage the redundancy in your network. So, for example, your, your operator stations. You want to test an HMI or an operator station. Well, you probably have, each operator probably has two, and there's a couple of, couple of operator stations in the room, so you might have six or eight. You pick one of those, and you test it hard, and you see if you can crash it. Uh, similarly, you might have a primary and a backup historian, hot and standby servers, like we just talked about, a real time and a standby server. And you also want to pick the best time to do this testing, because if you talk to the operations folks, you'll find that oftentimes there might be a certain period in the day when they get their schedule or when a lot of things happen. You want to pick a time when it's not real busy. So as you're creating your scan list, you want to find one of each type of system, and then you want to talk to the operations group, and you say, if we scan this system and it goes down, if it crashes during the testing window, is it acceptable? And then if it goes down and you need to recover it, do you have the ability to recover the system? And you do this component by component, server by server, workstation by workstation. 
device by device until you've identified one of each type of device that you can test. For each one of those questions, if the answer is yes, you schedule the scan. And again, you, you work closely with operations. You say, OK, we're starting to scan this server at this time. You have someone on standby in case there's a problem and it needs to be recovered. And then you say, OK, we're done with this server. Now we're going to do the next one. And this works. As I can tell you, it's, it's something we've done for 15 years. You can achieve this. What will happen, though, from time to time is you'll run into a server or some other device where you say, is it OK if that device goes down? And everyone gets really nervous. It's like, well, the guy who knew how to use that system retired seven years ago. And when we, reboot, when we reboot it, we're never quite sure if it's going to come up. And the vendor's been out of business for 10 years. So there's a, a high level of discomfort that they can recover that system. And this is actually very important to know because you may find in the control system that you're assessing that a key component is actually this fragile. Everyone says it's working, don't touch it. But if it breaks, this supposedly mission critical can never go down ICS has something very bad happen. So if the answer is no, you can't scan this because it can't go down or we can't recover it, you have one of two problems. If they say it's one of these systems that no one knows how it operates and, and if it goes down, it might never come back up, you have a recovery issue. And if it's an important device, it's probably a high level finding that you need the ability to recover that system. You should have, for all your systems, you should have a, a recovery time objective. So management should say, we need to be able to recover this server within four hours, or whatever time they see is acceptable. And then you should have to prove periodically that you can do that. Again, this is classic OT day stuff. This is something that is done all the time in IT and we need to take, carry over to OT. The other problem here is you may have a single point of failure. So if there's a device that can never go down and it's running a Windows operating system, we might be kidding ourselves. Those things go down from time to time. So Unix servers go down from time to time. Most control systems will have redundancy in them, but you, you probably some of you will and some of you won't be surprised that it's common to find one or more critical components that lack redundancy. They may have redundancy everywhere but in this one place. So that would be another security finding. So after all this, you should have created your scan list. And you should be able to go and test each one of these things under the parameters you agreed with operations. And if you bring it down, you will not cause an unacceptable impact to operations. It's really that simple. The reason you never created unacceptable impact to operations is operations has said it's acceptable for that component to go down. So by definition, it can't be unacceptable. OK, I'm going to shift gears now and get into the scanning tools. And, and these are the areas uh, we're going to cover. We'll start with basic enumeration. So this is just to find out what's on the network and what's running on what's on the network. And there's a number of tools that can do this. And some of the broad-based scanning tools can do this as well. But it seems like all the technical people that I talk to and I respect all seem to like Nmap, which is a free tool that you can get at nmap.org. It's free. It's fast. Uh, these experts claim it's more reliable, more accurate in terms of fingerprinting a device compared to some other solutions. 
And the other nice thing about it is if you run a, a really broad-based tool, you get this huge set of output. It's sometimes nice to have a limited set of output just to say, this is what the device is, this is what it's running. So you'll see most people who do assessments recommend Nmap for basic enumeration. Uh, you heard a little bit about um, some of the red point scripts that we've come up with recently. And these are Nmap scripting engine or NSE scripts. And they're available to add to Nmap. You can get them on our GitHub. Uh, and you can download them and they're documented. They're also being added to the Nmap distribution. It's just that tends to lag. We release it and then about three to six months later it gets into Nmap officially. But the whole purpose um, for creating these scripts and why, how we use them ourselves is to better enumerate ICS devices and applications on the network. And the way we do this in the script is we send legitimate commands to the device. So if we're looking for Ethernet IP devices, we will send Ethernet IP commands to the device. Or we recently released a script for uh, Schneider Modicon PLCs. We will send a special Schneider Modicon function code to get the information from the PLC. And where these can be really useful is for identifying ICS on the corporate network. So you can run this Nmap scan with scripts on your corporate network and say, has anyone connected my two networks? Can I find any ICS devices there? They're also really good for creating and maintaining inventory. I'll show you an example of this where you actually get uh, product names, physical locations, software versions. You get a lot of good information from this. And again, it's very low impact because it's using legitimate commands. And what we tend to do is anytime we run across a new device or application or any new component in the ICS, we'll create one of these scripts. And we'll use, we use a lot of them internally, but the ones that are more protocol based, uh, we release you know, for public use. And this is something you can do. So if you needed to create an inventory and you knew you had these types of systems, you could create these scripts to find them. So let's look at a couple of examples. And these are, these, you can see these examples on the GitHub page as well. So this is the Ethernet IP script. And it, it identifies, you see here, a lot of different vendors use this protocol. Uh, Rockwell Automation is the most popular one. So this is a, this is a, at this IP address, there's a panel view plus six, which is one of the little panels, looks like a little display that you can punch on and you can see the status of a machine. Um, you've got a WAGO PLC. Uh, you can see the, the version number, the IP address, a lot of information there. So let's say you just wanted to see, you had a, a lot of these uh, panel views and you wanted to see what version they were running. The script would tell you that. Uh, here's the back net, some be results from the BACnet uh, that we talked about earlier. This one is kind of interesting because from BACnet, not only can you get some information about the vendor product and the software version, but some of them will actually tell you there's a description field. So this is a system related to a boiler control system, and it's located in the biomed basement. So you can see how this could be really helpful for maintaining an inventory. And then there's, there's actually, there's more you can get from, this, from these tools, for example. This is part of the BACnet script. These are all the devices, all the IP addresses that this BACnet device is talking to. And then this, we grade this out, but these are foreign addresses. These are people that are talking to the BACnet device. So this would not be so much for inventory, but this could tell you if an attacker was talking to that device. So Nmap has a lot of capabilities. It has a lot of them out of the box, and you can customize it further if you like. The real workhorse, though, of your 
assessment is going to be a broad-based scanner. The uh, Nessus scanner that you're probably familiar with from Tenable Network Security is, is the most popular one uh, in terms of market share. It's also the one that we use and I'll be talking about. But there's other good ones from Rapid7, Beyond Trust, Trend Micro, uh, and there's, there's organizations like Qualys that will actually scan your network as a service. That's probably not appropriate, scanning as a service for an ICS, but that's, some people are debating that issue. So Nessus is this tool, and you can install it out of the box and select a default configuration and scan a system and get a lot of information. But if you're going to use it in an ICS, we really recommend you do the three things on the screen there. You use credentialed scanning, you actually get some training and learn the project and or product, and you can consider doing a security audit. So if we look at Nessus, or any of these broad-based scanners, anytime a new vulnerability comes out, they create a plugin. Anytime there's a new way for getting information, they create a plugin. So for example, when we issue our project Redpoint scripts, they create plugins. And I don't know what the actual number is. It was 50,000 plugins in 2010. I know it's over 75,000 now. It just continuously grows. But you won't actually run all these tests when you run a scan because you'll see, if you look over here on the right side, a lot of these are not going to apply to you. If you're scanning a, a Windows server, these Cisco tests are not going to apply. Or if you're not running this operating system, those tests are not going to apply. So you can go through and configure it so that it only runs the applicable tests, or Nessus can try to do that for you. Nessus will say, oh, it's this type of system. It's got a web server. I'll run web tests. It doesn't have a web server. I'll skip the web tests. Probably the most important thing to, if you're thinking about doing scanning with a broad-based uh, scanning tool, the most important thing for you to do is use credentialed scanning. And actually, we see very few people use this because out of the box, it's not set up to work this way. And what credentialed scanning does is it, you enter administrator credentials in Windows or root credentials in Unix, and then the scanner logs in with those privileges and is able to inspect the device. So if you were to run a scan without credentials, you might find, and let's say your system had not been patched for five years, you would get a short list of missing patches. If you run a credentialed scan, it's going to look at the registry, and it's going to tell you every patch that was missing. So you'll get a lot more accurate and full set of information from a credentialed scan. It's also less intrusive. So think of the most basic thing, a port scan. So let's say you want to know what ports are open. You can run a port scan, or you can run Netstat. A credential, a credential scan is going to run Netstat. So it's going to get information a lot faster, especially UDP port scanning. It's going to be much less intrusive. So if you think about that, um, that safety PLC example, now, it wasn't running Windows or Unix, so we couldn't do a credentialed scan. But if you hit that port with a port scan, bad things happen. With a credentialed scan, you wouldn't hit that port. You would just see it was open using Netstat. The other thing that uh, when you get this credentialed scan report, you will get critical vulnerabilities, high vulnerabilities, medium vulnerabilities, and then something they call information. Most people look at the critical and high, but what you really want to do is you want to look at the information because you're going to get a list of all the installed software on the system, all the running services, USB usage, group policy, permissions. They're not saying it's a vulnerability, but it's something that will be very helpful in your assessment. 
Uh, I just had a couple of screenshots here for adding credentials. There's just a window where you enter your username and password. What most people will do is they will create a scanning account for the team that's doing the scanning. And then you just disable the account when you're not doing the scanning. Okay, let's talk just a little bit. Let's talk about results for a second. You run a scan and you find you're missing a bunch of security patches. Probably a lot of Microsoft security patches, but sometimes if you're coming in to do the assessment, the team has been working frantically the last two weeks to get everything patched so you don't find anything. But they rarely will patch the third party application software. So you'll see web servers and, uh, and other applications, Java runtime environment, all sorts of things with vulnerabilities. And sometimes even the security software has vulnerabilities. People rarely patch their antivirus software, and yet it's deployed on everything. So if they're missing a patch on the antivirus software, that's a good way to get in. And we're even seeing now that there are ICS security patches. So you've seen all these vulnerabilities that have come out in control system applications. Well, there's patches. So you need all that, uh, all that different software in your security patching program. So let's say you ran this scan and you found all these missing patches. What you want to do is really look at the root cause. So yes, they're missing a bunch of patches, but if, if that's your finding, they might patch those systems and then they'll have the same problem in two years. What you really want to identify is that there is not an effective security patching program. And hopefully when you were doing interviews, you asked them about their security patching program and you compared the two. So let's say they said we patch every six months then you should only find missing patches from the last six months. Or sometimes they'll say, we only patch, apply the patches that our ICS vendor says we should apply. So then you get that list and you say, yes, they're doing it or no, they're not. And then you can judge whether that was a wise decision to follow that advice. Now, if we go into, if we go into security patching a little bit, um, you want to apply your security patches in a reasonable time period. On a corporate network, that's typically 30 days. We almost never see that in the ICS. About the best we see is people applying patches every 90 days. And one of the real challenges here, again, if we think about efficient risk reduction, one of the real challenges is if you're not doing any patching now, can you go from no patching to applying all the patches within 90 days. Because security patching is really hard. And the answer for most organizations is no. So when we look at the efficient risk reduction approach, you might not want to go all the way and say, we're gonna to go to patch everything in 90 days. You might want to see which systems are the most exposed and prioritize your security patching. So this would, be, this would be something that we would commonly recommend, is what systems are most exposed? Well, they're probably the ones in the ICS DMZ. The ones that the people on the corporate network can get to. So we might want to patch those very quickly, maybe every 30 days. Because remember, something on the DMZ should not be required for operations. So if for some reason there was an incompatibility, it would not affect operations. And then your next highest priority, your priority two, might be the computers that your priority one computers talk to. So maybe the corporate network talks to a server in the DMZ that talks to a historian on your control system. That historian on your control system could be priority two. Because, as you're probably aware, what attackers do is they try to compromise a system that they can reach, 
and then they pivot or jump from that system to other systems that they can reach. So they might try to compromise a priority one system and then jump to a priority two system. So if you could patch those every 90 days, that would be good. That'd be better, much better than what you were doing before. And if you have your network set up right, these priority one and priority two computers are probably somewhere between five and 20 computers. So you haven't, you haven't created this huge patching burden. Now everything else we would put into priority three. And this, this is a little controversial, but, but we would say, at least when you're starting out, try to patch everything once a year. And you're doing this as much just to maintain the software as you are to stop someone from attacking it. Okay, because you don't, if you're not patching every year, you're gonna run into something that's four or five years out of date is no longer in support, can't be rebuilt. Um, we've seen all sorts of problems when people don't do at least some updates. Now, if you're telling me, and we've had customers that say, no, annually is not good enough, we're gonna do it every six months or every 90 days, I'll say, great, fantastic. That would be a really good thing, do better. But whatever you say you're gonna do, make sure you do it. So we'd rather see you patch the most important systems frequently, get that under control, patch everything at least once a year, and then once you've done that for a while and proven you have that under control, then you move on to something more aggressive. The other reason why we say patching priority three computers maybe isn't as important as you think for efficient risk reduction is because of this insecure by design problem. If someone is inside your perimeter and on your control system, even if you have a fully patched system, they still are going to be able to affect the availability and integrity of your process. They don't need an exploit to do that. They don't need a missing patch. So having everything patched up doesn't really stop them anymore. So maybe getting everything patched every 90 days or every 30 days isn't as important for efficient risk reduction on the inside as you may think. Now I hope, you know, two or three years from now, I hope that's not true. But it's kind of where we are today. Okay, the second thing about the scanner is, your broad-based scanner, is you really need to know it. Because what we find oftentimes, again, is people won't just not know about credentialed scanning, but they also will not know about all the features and functions in the scanner. These are very complex products. And if you're just running the default scan, you're not gonna miss, or you're not gonna see a lot of the things you should. And if your job is to use this scanner, I would re highly recommend you take a class on it. Because you'll find so many things it can do that you didn't know about. So let me just give you a couple in Nessus. A lot of these control systems will have Oracle databases in them. And there are plugins to, to check the default credentials in Oracle. So if you run the Nessus scanner and it has the Oracle plugins checked, you might think, oh, I'm checking for all the default credentials in Oracle. And if you know Oracle, there's a lot of default credentials. And it's a long list, so it's very hard to remove them all. Um, but if you don't go into this, uh, oops, if you don't go into the preferences Oracle settings, which is way deep into the interface, and you don't enter the Oracle SID and check this box, it will not check for default credentials. So you'll get a report back thinking that you checked for default credentials and you really didn't. Now, Nessus could have designed their product better so you didn't have to know all this deep information to do it. I'm not saying this is a product feature, but there's a lot of cases like this where you're not gonna get the value from your product unless you really know it. Let me give you another one. This one has come in really handy. Um, Windows records when a USB drive is inserted. It will record what the USB drive and what the date it was first inserted. 
If you run Nessus in the default configuration, you'll just learn that a USB drive was inserted generically. If you go into preferences, global variable settings, and check this thorough test slow, it will actually tell you when each USB drive was inserted for the first time. So we've run into situations where we found malware on a computer and we can, we can determine when that malware was introduced to the computer. And since we check this box, we'll know, we can say, oh, a USB drive was inserted right at that same day. That's how it got onto the computer. Who was there doing work that day? He's the person that brought it into our system. And, and I'd say a couple times a year this happens where we identify the source of introduction of malware into a control system just by checking this box. And, I, and there's many, many more examples like that. Those are my two favorite of if you don't know how to run the tool right, you're going to miss a lot of good information. The third part about the Nessus scanner or a broad-based scanner is this compliance audit capability. So there's actually some plugins. You see them down here. There's a, a Unix compliance plugin and a Windows compliance plugin. And you can actually perform an audit of your system. So you can say, this is exactly how my operating system should be configured. Here's exactly how my application should be configured. And you put this into an audit file. And then this plugin right here will run that audit file against a system, and it will tell you everywhere your system was misconfigured. So this was, uh, we've generated some of these as part of our Bandolier project. And the, all the ones we've generated are available for free. But um, how these are being used is vendors take these audit files, and when they install a new system, they will, before they leave, they will run the audit file against the new system and they will tell the customer, here is your optimal security configuration. Here's the best way to secure this product. And here's a report showing you that we delivered it that way. And then the customers will run this audit file every six month or a year just to make sure the system is still configured right. So in general, there's, there's actually a, a place in the scanner where you enter the audit file. So for example, this is a, an, an audit file for an OSI soft Pi server running on Windows 2008. And there's about 200 checks for, operation, for operating systems settings. And then there are additional checks for the ICS application. And one of the things that we found most helpful was the permissions for the ICS folders. So when you install, and this is, this is something you can do when you go back to your ICS. When you install an ICS, they will install the application in Windows, probably program files, and then the application name. And they will create that folder, and they will assign privileges to that folder. It is amazing how many ICS applications are installed with privileges that allow everyone read, write, and execute access. That's completely unnecessary. So what, uh, what you can do in an audit file is you can work with the vendor and say, what is the least privilege requirements for access to that, to that directory? And then you can set those permissions, and then you can audit them. Now this, I would say that this is not something, if you are an end user of an ICS, you should not be creating an audit file. You pr probably your vendor should do that for you because they're going to know what the optimal security configuration is um, and, and they're going to do this for you know, once and then it'll support 20 or 100 customers. But you may need to modify the file a little bit. So let's say the vendor recommended eight long pa eight character passwords and your policy was nine. It's a really easy thing to change. Or maybe you installed some additional software on the system that the vendor didn't install. That's another easy thing to change. 
So this audit capability is a really powerful tool that these scanners have that is rarely used and, and highly recommended. Okay, the, the next, uh, I just have single slides on kind of the next few parts of testing because um, some can get really detailed and we don't have time and others are pretty simple. This is one of the simple ones. We said in an owner operator assessment, so if you are an end user of the system, we say you probably do not need to look for new vulnerabilities. This is the one exception to that. We always recommend random data fuzzing. And what this is, is you just determine what, uh, what TCP and UDP ports your application is using and just send some random data to those ports and see if they crash. Unfortunately, they crash all too often. It used to be really bad. Five years ago, just about everything crashed. Now it's much better. But what was happening was the vendors were testing that their product was built just right. So if you sent a valid command to it, it responded correctly. And it worked 100% correctly if you sent expected commands. But they weren't doing negative testing. They weren't saying, well, what would happen if someone sent the wrong thing to our system? And that, that was what was causing a lot of these crashes. And what's funny is you will see problems based on this, um, I guess these fragile applications or fragile services, sometimes even without an attacker going after them. You'll add a new component to the network that all of a sudden is sending some broadcast traffic on the network and things start crashing. So it's important to know that your that your um, ICS applications and services have some level of resiliency to them. So just send, it's a very crude test, just send some random data to it for a minute or two and see if it still is running properly. Now, you, you'll probably hear a little bit tomorrow, a, a truly skilled hacker will do this smarter. He won't just send random data, he'll record data and modify it slightly uh, to try to cause a crash that's exploitable. But that's probably more than you need to do as an asset owner. That's, that's really something your vendor should do. Okay, the next category is secondary testing. And this is a really big category that I'm gonna cover in one slide. First of all, sometimes it's not necessary. So if your system has so many basic problems, you probably don't need to dive deeply into each application to find those problems. You need to deal with the most basic things first. But let's say your, your system has a web server. There's specialized tools to do web testing. If it has a database, there's specialized tools to do database testing. You might want to do password cracking or a man in the middle attack where you get, date, where you get in between two components and grab that data and, and maybe replay that data or send uh, or modify that data. But that's, again, that's, that's stuff that you'll know, I, I'd say that's more advanced testing and you deal with that after you have the basics done. But you should just know that there's a whole set of tools out there that do that sort of thing. There's actually some really amazing tools out there. We just got a couple of them on Kickstarter. Uh, we got something that, uh, What's that card cloner called? R Fiddler. Oh, the R Fiddler. Uh, it will clone and a physical access card. So if you have an RFID card to get in the door, it will just record that signal and allow you to clone that signal. Uh, RF Cat will allow you to collect uh, radio much easier, radio signals much easier than it could before. And so if you get into this, you're going to have a very big toolbox and and you're probably gonna be adding to it constantly. There's, there's a lot of good tools out there and a surprising number of them are free. Uh, the things that usually cost you money now are if you need the hardware. And then the last thing I wanted to cover is proof of concept exploits. Do we bother doing proof of concept exploits? Well, there's two cases where we'll do them. One is, if you're doing an assessment and you see something and you're not sure if it's really vulnerable or not, 
you don't want to put in the report that you have a serious vulnerability when it's a false positive, when it really isn't a vulnerability. So in that case, you want to actually test the exploit to verify it. Now, if it's, if it's a low impact vulnerability, it's probably not worth the time. It's going to be very low on your list. But if you're going to go to management and say this key server could be taken over by someone because it has this vulnerability, you better be pretty sure it's actually there. And then the other case is if you have someone in management who just doesn't believe you. There's nothing more powerful than showing the HMI on the attacker's computer on the corporate network. And sometimes you have to do that. And a lot of times it's a trivial exploit, but you have to do that just to show that it actually can happen. And the tool that most people use for this type of thing is Metasploit. But there are other tools that you can get. Uh, um, Core Impact has a tool. Um, what's the one that Dave Itell has? Oh, shoot. Canvas. Canvas, yeah, Canvas is another tool. There's a, there's a bunch of these. And then you'll also get people that will write their own exploits. But uh, most people will just use Metasploit. There is a free version available and there's a paid version available for it. And it's very powerful and good for doing demonstrations of exploits. And I think um, I don't want to get into your break too much, so I, I think I'll stop there. And uh, I'd be happy to take any questions if there are any. I know it's been a long day, but happy to answer any questions. You guys have taken it easy on me. I do appreciate that. Yes. Um, what percentage of um, operations people welcome you to scan a live system? Ah, good question. Well, it's probably a two-part answer. First of all, I mean, Digital Bond is a consulting company, so people are paying us to be there. So somebody is wel welcoming us in. But sometimes we're hired by IT and sometimes we're hired by the factory. So usually if we're hired by the ICS side, they're, they're welcoming right away and it, it's not a problem. If, the, if we're hired by the IT department, then it is a struggle early on. But what we found is if they know you understand control systems and you start working, you go from at the beginning where they're telling you, oh, you can't test that, you can't test that, and then you test a couple of things, they see how you do it, and then they, then they start to say, oh, let's look at this, and let's look at that. So if the IT department brings you in, they're hesitant at the beginning, but once they see the information that's coming in, they tend to be very supportive. Um, they're also very supportive if they understand that uh, your report is not going to say that they need to go from where they are today to perfection in six months. You know, you, you have to work with them to understand what is realistic. And I guess the third part of the answer is the more you focus on impact, um, and the key question is, what would happen if? So you just ask that over and over again. What would happen if that system goes down? What would happen if an attacker could connect there? What would happen if this, if someone could change this display? And sometimes you have to ask the question about four different ways, but that really tends to engage them. Any other questions? Um, to get an idea of how long it will take to train a person, um, how long did it take to get to the point that you were comfortable using a tool on a control system, ah. including the learning process? OK. Um, a lot of that depends on your background. Okay, so if you're coming from the control system side of it and you don't have IT experience or IT security experience, it's probably going to take you, I don't know, maybe a month to be able to use the tools competently. Um, and, and some of that would be training class and then some of it trying it in the lab. Now that doesn't mean you're going to know all the secondary testing tools, but you're going to be able to run Nmap maybe be able to run Nessus or some other scanner and a little bit of Metasploit. You could probably do that in a month. 
Um, if you come from the IT security side, you probably already know the tools. And in that case, it's really more cultural than anything else. You just need to understand maybe the language, um, the culture, and that sort of thing. I'll give you a real good example. Um, some people get really hung up on whether something is a SCADA or a DCS or something else. And, and they'll, they'll get really worried about that. And my advice is call it whatever the person you're doing the assessment for calls it. So I've gone in and done assessments on DCS that they call SCADA. And I don't write DCS in the report and I don't explain to them why it is truly a DCS and not a SCADA system. So I think that the challenge from the IT security side, they could probably be helpful on day one with the right attitude. And certainly within a week, you know, if they were to take, there's a number of good training courses from ISA. There's actually one being taught in Japan from ISA 99 um, and, and others that if you went to that course and had IT security experience, you could help out right away.